a former professional soccer player turned priest. What happened? This is Dive Deep. From the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois, this is Dive Deep, where we dive deep into our Catholic faith. I am Andrew Hansen, coming to you from the BOS Center at our Eucharistic Congress, October 28th. And we are so pumped to have Father Chase Hilgenbrink join us, one of our featured speakers. Father Chase from Peoria, the Diocese. Thanks for coming on Dive Deep. How are you? It's an incredible honor to, to be invited here today. So such a This is going to be a momentous event, I think, for your diocese for years to come. And, and, and maybe for you know our church around the world, everybody's doing these awesome events to, to celebrate Jesus in the Eucharist, and it's honored to, to be invited. And we can't wait to hear your talk. But and we're going to get into your talk. So for you who, who can't be here today, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But first, I want to get into your story. Uh, former professional soccer player turned priest. I want to ask about that. But before I do, what do you love about being a priest? The most. What surprised you about becoming a priest? Now that you've been a priest for for several years now. You know, so many people, the obvious answer to that is celebrating the sacraments. I mean, there's nothing on earth that's greater, objectively speaking, than doing that. Uh, however, I've, I've, I've adjusted that answer because I think it's the, the answer that most people are expecting. And, and the answer that I would give, honestly, is, is that I, I'm so humbled and, and so surprised that you mentioned what is surprising, that people invite you into their lives in the most important times in their life, right? I get to be a part of people's lives during, during all their highlights. And some of that includes suffering, but suffering that, that leads to redemption, you know? But uh, when a baby is born, they call a priest to baptize. When, when somebody receives Jesus for the first time in Holy Communion, I get to be there. When someone wants to get married, which they call is like the, the, the greatest day of their entire life. Most people will say that about their marriage. They call me. I guess it's amazing. When they're preparing their loved one to see Jesus Christ face to face after death, they call the priest. Like, it, it's such an honor. It's so humbling. Um, but it's, it's, it's the most important thing I've ever done in my life. That's really just exciting to hear. Your joy that you exhibit, that's, it's so refreshing to hear that. So that's awesome. All right, now I want to get into your story. I want to first talk about your childhood. Born, born and grew up in Bloomington. Talk about your faith as a child. Was it laid? Good foundation? Take us back to your childhood. What do you remember about the Catholic faith? Were you like most teens? Did you fall away? Or take us to those days as a youngster. I'll take you back before uh, before Bloomington because I was born in the Springfield Diocese, which is uh, in Quincy, Illinois. Wait, are you saying you should be a priest in our diocese? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I, I've been accused of, of leaving the diocese many times, but that's not true. I, I grew up in uh, on a farm in Ursa, Illinois, just north of Quincy, and, and um, we thought we were going to be farmers. And my, my grandfather tells a story that, that he always said that I, I was claiming at five years old that I was going to be the one to take over the farm. You know, but the 80s hit and, and the, the recession of the 80s kind of kicked my parents off the farm and they were young and, and just getting a start and they needed they needed to find work. And so that brought us to, to Central Illinois and we came into the Peoria Diocese. I lived my entire life in the, Peoria, in the Peoria Diocese, which is why I'm a priest there today. That's the place that I do call home while much of my family still remains in, in Quincy. But my faith as a child, you know, I, I grew up in a good German, Irish, Catholic family. You know, it was, it was as you, you might expect. My parents expected us to do what Catholics do. We go to mass and we go to confession, you know? I, I, I describe it this way now to no offense to my parents, but because we both know the difference now that we were, we were a family of, of great faith, but not on fire for the faith, right? So we were like, I think, most Catholics who needed renewal, who needed, who needed to light that fire of the Holy Spirit. So we were faithful, but not on fire, you know? And so um, I, I did what I was supposed to do. I'll talk about it a little bit today in the story, but um, it, it, it was really because of my parents' influence that I, that I remained a Catholic. And yes, sports were more important to me than the Catholic Church, than Jesus Christ and the Eucharist, all of those things, I, partly because of the immaturity, but partly because I didn't understand my faith fully. I went to college, and, and in those college years was really, really when I asked for the first time, am I a Catholic? Do I continue to do this? Is this something that I do outside of my family, or is it just because my parents like told me that this is what I do, you know? And it was at that moment, my freshman year of college, that, that I realized I didn't know who I was if I weren't Catholic, right? And it scared me. Like, uh, talk about identity crisis that we're having in the world today. The deepest identity crisis is, is not knowing who you belong to and if you belong to Jesus Christ or not. That defines everything. That changes everything. And, and, and I was scared of that. So I continued to go to Mass until I got it, until I found out, until I understood, until Jesus encountered me in the Eucharist. And that changed everything until I made a decision that I was a Catholic, that I wasn't just, just going to live an inherited faith, but I was going to live a faith that I chose. Take us to that moment. You're at Clemson University. You're playing soccer. Again, we, you said you're in Bloomington. Stud, stud soccer player, which led you to Clemson. 
even that question popping in your head, like, wait, why am I Catholic? What, what am I doing here? Do you remember that moment? Was it, it just popped in your head? Or do you think there were seeds that built to all of a sudden this one day you're like, you were overwhelmed with this question? You know, um, well, it, it happened really the first week of campus, right? First week on campus, I think I asked the question. I said, do I go to mass this Sunday? I've been complaining my whole life about going to mass. Would I be a hypocrite to go to mass, right? Like, well, who, who am I and what do I do? And it was, it was, again, a little bit of that fear of not knowing was the reason that, that I chose to go to mass, but it was being there, being at mass. And really, as I say, I think that mass was the first time I ever heard a homily in my life. Right? The first mass, the first time I listened, the first time that I started, when I went because I chose, when I went because uh, it was my decision, I started to hear the prayers. I started to actually pray the prayers that I already knew by memory. And all of a sudden, th there was a richness that was growing. And that's the place where, where yes, I, I grew in this <clears throat> love and respect for what was actually happening in the liturgy, even though it was, it was a struggle to live the Catholic faith, I fully admit. Um, I, I, I was bought in to, to this. And, and talk about people in college that want to be different. This was the way that I was different. There, I, was, I was in the Bible Belt and there was, there was thousands of people going to the Baptist church across the street. And, and there was, you know, the 10 of us at, at the Catholic chapel um, going to mass. And I thought, this is, this is actually who I am. This is what I'm about. And, um, and, and I actually love living this faith. It would take another turn years later when I was playing professional soccer. Yeah, and I would get into that. So you go off to Chile, you're playing professional soccer in Chile. Not, not talking about your faith here, but what was it like going there? Culture, language? Was it overwhelming? Were you excited? Were, maybe were you leaning on your faith a little bit? Did, it, did the faith go away a little bit because you're now, now hyper-focused on being a professional soccer player? You know, um, I, I was really confirmed in my, in my Catholic faith. Not sacramentally, yes, I was confirmed, but, but really confirmed, convicted about my Catholic faith when I left. In fact, I realized that that was going to be kind of the stronghold of my life. I, I was nervous about moving to it. I was 22 years old, thinking I'm a big man, right? Packing my bags to go play a professional sport. But in my heart, I, you know, moving away from family like that for the first time and not having any security around me, even, even the friendships that, that I knew. And, and moving away from that, yes, there was a, a culture shock and the customs and the language and, and, and not having f friends and family built into my, to my structure, my support system. And uh, when I got there, I really wasn't received well. I was a North American in a country that shouldn't be able to play soccer well, coming to take the job of those who have spent their life doing this, who have left high school in order to play this game, right? And, and now I, I wasn't really well received. I, there wasn't immediate friendship that I've kind of had naturally my entire life. And all of a sudden I started to ask like, what, what do I, I practice for two hours a day. What do I do with the rest of my time? I found myself walking into the only place that I knew, and that was the Catholic Church, in the presence of Jesus in the, in the Eucharist. That was the place where I would eventually know that I was called to the priesthood. Yeah, and I want to get into that moment now. So you're down in South America, you're playing professional soccer. From a cultural standpoint, you got it all. Professional soccer, getting paid to play sports. Boy, people know who you are. But do you have this still sense of, you have this emptiness about you? Or was, was that kind of what you think ultimately led you to all of a sudden even being open to the prospect of being a priest? And then take us to that moment when you, re when you heard God's voice. Sure, yeah, there was, this was a new moment of questioning. Like, what is going on with my life? For the very first time, I was thinking, I have everything that I want and it's not enough. Like, how, how does that happen? I always thought that high school soccer, like wearing a high school jersey would be enough. And then you're like, that's not enough. I want to play college soccer. Well, playing college soccer is enough. No, 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 it's not enough. And I want to play professional soccer. And then you get there, you say, this will be enough because that's the end of the line. But what happens when you get to the end of the line and it's not enough? Then you start to look interiorly and say, what is going on with my life? And where is my life going? Like, what could possibly be next? And I was thinking, maybe it's more money. Maybe it's a new house. Maybe it's another car. Maybe it's a different girlfriend. Maybe it's, you know, what, what is this? More parties? I don't know. A new team? You, you constantly start to... to to interchange goods that you think are, are good in your life. But it was really uh, going into that chapel day after day, not knowing how to pray a holy hour. I'd never prayed a holy hour in my life, not really knowing how to pray. I knew Hail Marys and Our Fathers. Um, but I sat before the Lord and I just started to expose my heart. I just said, Lord, this is where I'm at. Like, I'm not really comfortable. I don't, I don't know what is going on. This is my dream. This is everything I've ever wanted. You granted every one of my prayers and here I am and I'm not happy with it. So what's, what's wrong with me? And it was in those moments that I was praying for comfort. I was praying for the Lord to, to reveal what, what was the next thing for me. And uh, I didn't believe that I was outside of the, the sport of soccer. I thought I was gonna play until the day I died, right? Like, um, and it was in that moment that I heard the words, be my priest. You hear that though, 
are you just like, whoa, 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 God. I mean, come on though, that, that's a little bit too much. I mean, I'm, I'm a soccer guy, I wanna be soccer. Or were you like, oh, okay. Because again, I think from, from an outside point of view, the culture is gonna be like, Father Chase, wait a minute. You didn't, you didn't like slap yourself across the face and be like that, that, that God's just playing a joke on me. I mean, what take us to that? Certainly my first reaction was, is that you? <laughs> like who speaks like, I've never heard a voice like that in my life. And I thought, is that, was that me speaking that to myself? Like we, a lot of people ask even today when they're praying, like, how do I know God's voice from my voice? And what I, I've spent a lot of time discerning that. Right. But, but I, I thought it, why would, why would he speak that to me? And, and I, was, I was convicted that it, that it was the Lord, that it wasn't just my conscience, that there was something deeply spoken to me and it, and it didn't go away. But yes, my, my first reaction was, dude, you got the wrong guy. You got the wrong guy. There was never, no, it, and, 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 and really there wasn't a, a reaction of, of whether this is a good idea for me or whether it was a bad idea. There was no consideration whether this was going to happen. That, that's not possible. It's not possible for me to be a priest. Like that, that's not, like priests are born right out of the womb. Right. They, they come like, no, but but not me. I'm a regular guy and I've got a lot of mistakes and I you should see my life right now. Like this couldn't be me. He wouldn't call me. So the first, at first instance, there was no, there was no consideration of taking it seriously. And then you're chewing on that though. You keep going back and you keep hearing that voice. And then what eventually kind of gave you the courage to say, okay, this is actually a thing. Do you remember that time? Yes, and, it, and it's a gradual process. Every day for the next three years, I, there wasn't a day in which I didn't think about that, in which it wasn't on my mind, in which it wasn't growing, right? I had every excuse in the book that, that every seminarian has of why they shouldn't become a priest. And slowly, I, I found out like over three years, like those were dissipating, they were going away. They were being answered by every homily that I heard, by every book that I read. My, my dad and mom sent me a book by Dr. Scott Hahn. I don't know if you guys heard of him. Uh, <laughs> He sent me this book called Rome Sweet Home, right? It's his own conversion story. And in that book, uh, there's a lot of context to this, but eventually in that book, he says, delayed obedience is disobedience. And it just, it, but that line will stick with me forever. It just, it was like the Lord speaking to me through that man. Delayed obedience is disobedience. I knew, I knew that the Lord was calling me to this and I was saying no actively every day, every day. And so it was throughout that time, finally, we won a championship and, 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 and a lot of things went well for us. A lot of parties, a lot of, I mean, everything. And I was just th thanking the Lord, like, this is great. This is amazing. This is everything that I've ever wanted. And in, a, and in the next moment, I just realized the emptiness of my heart and saying, I have, I literally have everything that I believe that I had wanted. And now I've come to the conclusion that my dreams will never fulfill me. What an amazing thing to say, to like come to the realization, my dreams will never fulfill me. It was, it was terrifying and it was also freeing. All of a sudden I felt this, this freedom and I thought this is enough, this is, this is not enough and it will never be enough for me. And I thought at 25 years old, I have no plan after this. Like this was it. This is all that I had planned for my life. There's nothing more. So where does it go? And what happens? Here's the question that, that really got me that night. I remember asking the question, what if I never become the man that God created me to be? I mean, did God put me on earth for a purpose? Does he have a plan for my life? Can he communicate that to me? I believe if, if he didn't, he would have to be evil, right? Like, and he's not. He did communicate it to me. He did have a plan for my life. And what if I never become that man? So you changed back. me. And so you come back to America, you sign with the uh, New England Revolution for MLS. You, of course, resign and, and enter the seminary at this point. What are your friends? What are your, uh, what are your family members? What are they saying to you when you say, hey, I actually am quitting soccer and I'm going to the seminary school? Telling, telling the world, telling my family, telling my family was the first people that I told. Um, and they kept it a secret for, for several years, <laughs> or not several years, several months uh, uh, in, until this, this news became public. I was terrified when, when the news came out of what, what people would think, what my own teammates would think. There was no one on my team that knew this. There was, no one, there was no, none of my friend group. I started calling one by one the week before it was announced, one by one, some of my best friends in life and, and telling them what was about to happen. Some of them had no idea what I was talking about. Some of them were, were like, congrats, good for you, you know? But, um, but really, I was really surprised that um, the way that I was, the way that I was treated, was was phenomenal. So there were so many people who, um, that really, at least at least to my face, were, were very supportive and 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 really, um, I think I was I was afraid, um, perhaps for no cause, but um, it certainly made a splash in the press and and um, and and that was kind of a fun time to be, give witness to the church. So 2014 Peoria, you become a priest. When you look back, what goes through your mind? Crazy story. Right? 
Yeah, I, no, I, I just I just always say I can't believe the life that I've that the Lord has allowed me to live. I feel like I've lived two dreams in one life already, you know, and 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 my first dream, of course, was was playing professional soccer. I, I feel be, blessed beyond belief. And I know that the Lord allowed me to do that. I know that he wanted me to do that. I know that he desired me to do that, to be able to give witness to what I'm doing, to, to what I'm doing today and, and witness, especially to the youth. Um, but to be able to be a priest, there's, there's nothing compares. And I, and I tell the youth all the time, being a priest is, 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 is greater than ever being a professional athlete. And I mean that to the core. I mean that with the Eucharist, you know, close by me right now. I mean that um, with, with all my heart, that, that doing what God desires us to do, there, there's nothing else in life. What, where else will you go, right? What, what, what else are we gonna do, right? Everything comes to an end, but this relationship with Jesus, it never ends. What's your message for people here today at the Eucharistic Congress? Today, the, the, the theme is going to be the Eucharistic priority. How do we make the Eucharist the priority of our life? Objectively, it already is. Objectively, the Eucharist is the priority of the church. The question is, why is it not the priority of every single member of the church? And how do we get that back? How do we remember Jesus' Eucharistic priority and make Jesus' priority my priorities in life? A couple more questions, Father Chase. I mean, it's just fascinating talking to you, you know, hearing your joy, hearing your enthusiasm. It's, it's refreshing. But of course, so many Catholics, even practicing Catholics, go through, whether it's the rut of, I don't know, you're going to Mass, you go through the motions. What are some things you think we're doing wrong as practicing Catholics? Of course, as non-practicing Catholics, what can we be doing differently to have that joy, that enthusiasm? So when we come to Mass, we're like, this is it. Like, this is the real thing. This is awesome. Certainly. And, then, and, and this is a preview for those who aren't able to be at the talk today, but several of these things I'm going to talk about. But what is it that we're doing that, to foster that excitement about our faith? And, and usually, if we're not truly involved in something or giving our heart to something, right, we're not as invested as, as we could be or excited or have the, the, the greatest amount of love that we could have for that thing. And so what is our preparation, the remote preparation for, for receiving Jesus in the Eucharist? How are we living our lives outside? Why do we think that we can live a, a world out here? And this is, this is part of my own story. How do I think that I can live a world out here that is so distinct from the world that is inside this church and then come to church and be like, oh, I totally get it right? Or, or this makes perfect sense, or I do love Jesus in the Eucharist. No, at some point I might even reject him because it's so different from what's, what we're living outside. But certainly some of the, the, the regular um, preparations for Mass. And, and what, about our, what about our intention every time that we receive, receive the Eucharist? What about uh, the prayers that we pray during Mass? What do we do after Mass? What, what, what happens after that? Is the Eucharist the priority of our day? Or is it what we'll get around to when we have time? Okay, so we're just thinking about how, I mean, if I want to be on fire for something, I'm going to give my life to this, right? That's why I think the joy of the priesthood is, is so good. I, give, I get to give my life to the Eucharist every single day. I don't know what else can compare, right? And so um, if there's joy in me, it's because of that. And, and anybody can share in that joy. Final question I want to ask you is, we live in a culture that is all about money, fame, fortune. It's about social media clicks, about comments, shares, YouTube, all that sort of stuff. Again, people look at your life and they say, you had it all, Father Chase. You had the you had the professional athlete, you had the fame, and then you gave it up for, for being a priest. What's your message though for people who seem to be just dwelling on, I, I wanna be famous or I want that social media click and, and they're just, it's all about the culture. What would you say to them? Yeah, and, and you know, I, I would I would first ask, where is that where is that life leading? Right? What is your goals? I'm a goal oriented person. I'm a mission oriented man. Where does that life lead? What what is, that, what is that ultimately going to give you, right? At the same time, we, we have to remember um, that what, what is it that sets our, our hearts on fire? Like, what is it that, that gives me the quality of life? Um, sure, all of those things are fun. And if those are the ways in which you seek greatness, as long as it's in line morally, right, with, with what we teach, which, what, what the Lord teaches, what the church teaches, there's nothing wrong with seeking greatness. That's why I say I don't think there was anything wrong with seeking uh, professional, to be a professional athlete and giving my life to that, right? Um, at the same time, will we yield in the midst of that when the Lord shows us the greatness of what He's doing in and through us, through those means? We can be great on social media. We can bring the gospel to the entire world. Why don't we use it? If the devil's using it, the Catholic Church should be using it, right? If we don't get there, somebody else will, right? Whatever it is that you're doing, you can use your gifts, your talents, your desires to glorify God. These are not separate worlds. We are here as Christians, as infiltrators of the world. And if we infiltrate this world and use the gifts that we've been given for God's glory, it'll be just as exciting as getting clicks for something else. <laughs>
Let's get. Let's make money for the church. I love let's it. Make, I love bring it. it in. Sweet, Father Chase Sogenbrink, you're the man. Thank you so much for coming on Dive Deep. Thank you for your testimony, your enthusiasm. It's it's refreshing. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Sweet. If you would like more podcasts, head over to dive.org/podcast. Until next time, we'll see you right here on Dive Deep.